Hey folks, welcome back for another episode of Code Club. In recent episodes, I've been doing a lot of benchmarking. We're ready to start taking the ideas that we learned from that benchmarking and apply it to the package that I've been theoretically working on called Philotyper, which is a package designed, uh, that will be designed as we're designing it here, uh, to classify DNA sequences. And again, you may or may not care about classification of DNA sequences from bacteria. The bigger point, as I hope you have seen as we've gone through the recent episodes, is some of the engineering and some of the questions that come to mind as we're building out this tool. Um, also, uh, I would like to have this tool be hosted on CRAN. And so there's kind of a format and a process you have to go through to make sure that that works. And so we're using um, a lot of tools uh, that we've been hearing about or reading about in the R Packages book by Jenny Bryan and Hadley Wickham. So I would like to reorient myself to my project before we start applying all the great stuff we've been learning in the recent episodes to our project. And so that's what we're gonna do today. One of the things we are going to do, taking a suggestion from one of you viewers who said, why not make it Philotype, P-H-Y-L-O-T-Y-P-R, uh, which I think is a great idea. I like unconventional spellings and that, that works great. So we'll go through that as well. So I'm gonna fire things up by launching the philotyper.rproj file. And I noticed that immediately, our studio is telling me that there's an update available. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that. And in the process, I will show you how to update our studio and possibly R as well. So I'll go ahead and quit and download that. That button brings me to the RStudio website for RStudio desktop. And so there's two things that you always need, um, R and RStudio. I have R installed. If I open up a terminal and type R, I see that I'm using 4.3.3, which was released at the end of February. So uh, about two months ago as I'm recording this. And I know that there was a new version that came out just a couple days ago, um, or maybe a, a week or two ago, I think on April 24th. So let's go ahead and install R, and then we'll also install R Studio. So we'll go ahead and click on this button, which brings us to CRAN. And I've got a Mac, as you can see, but if you've got a Windows computer, there's links for that as well as for Linux. I'm gonna to go to the Mac. One of the things that people often get confused on is what type of computer they have <laughs> uh, for working with a Mac. And so one of the things is, am I using Apple Silicon or an older Intel Mac? So one of the ways to tell would be to come to the Apple in the upper left corner about this Mac. And what you'll see is chip Apple M1 Max. So that M1 corresponds to a Silicon Mac. If you didn't see that M something, uh, then that would tell you that you had an Intel Mac. If you screw it up, don't worry. <laughs> uh, go ahead and download the other thing. And again, I think if you're installing Windows, the process might be a little bit more streamlined. So I'm gonna go ahead and get 4.4 for my M1 Mac. This will take a minute to download. So go back to my downloads directory. And this first one is what I want. So I'll go ahead and double click on that. And this will launch an installer uh, puppy cup, I guess, for 4.4 um, on my Mac. And I'll kind of click through, continue on all these defaults and install that. And then I'll enter my password. And this then proceeds with the installation. That tells me it was successful. And so um, we'll go ahead and move that installer to the trash. And now if I come back to my terminal, um, I need to quit out of R, but if I go ahead and do R again, we see that we now have version 4.4 loaded on my computer. Again, that was released uh, at the end of April. I do try to kind of stay current with my versions of R, mainly because I'm teaching people R and um, I don't want someone to have a newer version than me in case something goes weird, but because uh, people are always gonna be watching this in the future, <laughs> they're not gonna be watching this in the past. I don't know, maybe that makes sense. I also just like to have new shiny things. Back to our studio. And so now we need to install our studio. I'll go ahead and click on this to get the installer. Uh, and it knows what kind of computer I have. It says Mac OS 12. It also has other installers for Windows and various Linux distributions. So this is a bit of a bigger beast. It's about 565 megabytes. Um, I'm on my home internet, and so it tends to be a little bit slow. Um, this was also just released uh, in the last week, I guess April 29th. So that's sort of been, oh, um, I think over the weekend. So that took about three minutes to download. I'll now go ahead and double click on the icon. And I think all I have to do is maybe drag RStudio over into the applications directory. It then warns me that there's an older version present. Do I want to replace it with the newer version? Yes, go ahead and replace. Again, I'll enter my password. That took a couple seconds to copy over because it is a bit of a big file. So now 
let's try this again. <laughs> we'll come back to our phylotyper directory, double click on the rproj file, and see what happens when we try to launch it now. So initially it warns me that this was downloaded from the internet. Pretty much every app is downloaded from the internet at this point, I think. So anyway, I guess unless you're writing it yourself, yes, I wanna go ahead and open it. And we see that we have version 4.4. Didn't get that message about having an older version of RStudio. Um, if I click on this about RStudio, I see that I've got the 2024-04 um, version, which was the correct version. So I'll go ahead and say okay to that. Um, I'm now getting a warning message that there is no package called DevTools. So one of the things that you might recall is that in my R pro profile file, um, I have required dev tools. And so basically that, what that means is that every time I start R or R Studio in this case, from my phylotyper directory, what it's going to do is it's going to, it's going to basically do library or require on dev tools. And so what happened was we went from 4.3.3 to 4.4.0. And so what that means is wonderfully, I'm going to have to install all new packages for everything I do um, that I'd previously been using in 4.3.3. Anyway, RStudio will keep me up to date on what I do and don't have. Um, luckily it looks through the files and says package dev tools required, but not installed. So I'll go ahead and install that. So another package that I'll go ahead and install because I know I will need it at some point is the tidyverse. Uh, the tidyverse really isn't a pure package, if you will. It is a package, but it's a collection of packages. It's a meta package, so it's a package of packages that gets us things like dplyr and ggplot2 and all these things that it just listed off as dependencies. So this will also take a minute or two to go ahead and install, but while I'm installing things, I may as well go ahead and install tidyverse as well. So as that was installing, I got to thinking, how often does R put out a new version of R? So if you go to the R programming language Wikipedia page, and then you come down, uh, you'll see a link here for version names. And so this has a nice table. Uh, and so it's got the version. So again, this is the one that just came out. Um, and so the this is called semantic versioning. And so it's a the first number is the major release. The second is a minor release. And then the third number is a patch. So going from like 4.3.0 to 4.3.3, you shouldn't really notice any significant differences. Um, going from 4.3.3 to 4.4, we might start to notice things, but certainly going from like three to four, you're gonna notice bigger changes, right? So the jump to version four was uh, about four years ago, right, in 2020. Um, and let's see, uh, when we go from two to three, so that was 2013, right? So that was like a seven year uh, lag um, for a major release, right? Um, so that's interesting. Um, and let's see, um, so those are, so those changes are much more on kind of the multiple year time scale. And the minor releases, uh, at least in this case, seems to be about once a year between, yeah, so every year, uh, and it seems like it's more or less in April or May that we get a new minor release and a new patch. So again, that's the third digit. Uh, comes out every maybe two to four months. Again, if there's a major release, again, if this number goes to five, <laughs> um, version 5.0.0, you'll definitely wanna make that change. If this now goes to 4.5, then you'll probably wanna make that change pretty quickly. But if this goes to 4.4.1 in a month or two, you may not notice anything, right? And you might not feel really compelled. But the only time that you'll really feel it in terms of having to reinstall packages is when this middle number changes. I think we're now in good shape. I'm gonna double check that this all works by quitting our studio and starting it again. And we shouldn't get that warning message about dev tools not being installed. And we're good, cool. So again, over in our files, what we see is that um, I've got these benchmarking files, right? And so we did some stuff on vectors and lists and more stuff on data frames. And then I also have what I'm calling a vignette which is trying to basically read in data and use the functions on real data, not some synthetic or simulated data like I did up here or on some kind of like toy examples like I did in the tests. And so I'm gonna go ahead and create a new directory that I'll call benchmarking. And that puts that down here. And I've got everything under version control 
And so you can kind of move things around with like the MV function or manually dragging the icons. I prefer to do things in Git because if I do Git MV, then Git is gonna keep track of the history of the file going back to say when like benchmarking.r was in the project root directory. So I will go ahead and do git mv, and I will then uh, move the benchmarking, um, and I'll do star dot star. So this won't match the directory, right? So if I go ahead to test that and do ls, then I get my four benchmarking files, right? And so I'm gonna go ahead and do, like I said, git mv that to benchmarking as the directory. If I do git status, I now see that these files have been renamed, preserving uh, that history. And so um, I'll go ahead also, I think, and move my vignette and my train set data into there as well. So I'll do, again, git mv vignette and then train set uh, into benchmarking. It's not happy with how I tried to do that. So again, I'll do git status just to see how things look. Uh, the vignette didn't get moved over. I'll go ahead and do git mv vignette into benchmarking, get status up. That did move, now do get MV. Um, I think what I tried to do uh, was like this, right? So basically I tried to rename train set to be benchmarking and I want the forward slash on that and we'll do benchmarking into that. So basically I'm going to be moving this into benchmarking. Ah. Let's see, source directory is empty. Is it really? No, it's not empty. So let me try one more thing, where if I put the slash on the benchmarking and no slash on that, nope, it's not happy about that either. So I'm gonna move everything <laughs> into benchmarking individually. So I'll do get MV train set on that with the star to match everything and put that then into benchmarking. Ah, and now I see what the problem is. Train set is not under version control. Cool, so I can drop the git and I can probably just do mv train set into benchmarking slash. That works fine. So I think all my problems were here was because um, I didn't have train set under version control. And I don't wanna keep it under version control because this exists elsewhere and it's a, it's a pretty big hefty set of files, right? Um, if I do lslth on benchmarking train set, um, I see that you know, the fast day file is 38 megs and the other is two. So they're not ginormous, but at the same time, I don't want this kind of lingering around with the package. Anyway, um, again, if we do get status, we see all that stuff has been moved over. One thing I want to make sure though, is that when we build the package, that we're not gonna try to build the benchmarking directory. And so if you come over, um, you'll notice that there's a .r build ignore file. And so I've included a train set there, right? And so what I could put in here would be the same kind of syntax. So the caret, which is shift six, matches the beginning of a string. And here I will put benchmarking. And then the dollar sign matches the end of it, right? And so I'll go ahead and remove that train set, save this. And now if I do get status, I see I've modified dot r build ignore. I'll go ahead and add that. Then I'll do git commit and I'll say move benchmarking type files to new home. Okay, great. And now we do get status. We're back to green. All is good. All right, so we're cleaning things up, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and close my terminal and the background jobs. Go ahead and I'm going to come to build and I'm going to run test to make sure everything tests okay. So that is good to go. And so now I'm gonna run this check, which before I wasn't doing a very good job of running consistently. And so we'll see what this says. So this gave me two warnings and a note. Um, and so let's see. So it says kind of looking at the bottom, I guess we could start at the bottom or start at the top. Um, I'm gonna to start at the bottom because this is the first thing I see. And so this is one of those notes. So notes aren't horrible, um, like a warning. But uh, my understanding from reading that R packages book is that a note might get your package kicked back to you by CRAN when you try to submit it. So it's best to have no errors, no warnings, and no notes. And so what this is saying is no visible global function definition for NA omit. So we're gonna go ahead and open up um, our file. So we'll do use R 
and then we'll give it the name of the file and it's kmers. And so this opens up our file. Of course, I could have come here to files and navigated there, but you know, sometimes it's nice to be able to use the keystrokes because at least I feel a little bit more efficient doing it that way. So here we're converting our kmers into a integer and adding one. So it's one based rather than zero based. And if it's an NA, uh, if it has an NA in it, then I want to kick it out, right? So basically what that would mean would uh, be like if, if I had a degenerate base or if I had a non A, T, G, or C in my sequence, then we're going to exclude that kmer from consideration, okay? So we talked about that in a previous episode, but NA omit, um, we need to say what package it came from. I thought it was in base R. So a handy way to figure out where it came from is to do NA omit with a question mark in front of it. And so then we see that NA omit as well as some other functions are part of the stats package that comes with base R. So we can do stats colon colon save, and then we can come back to build and recheck it and see if that note goes away. Wonderful. That note went away and now we're left with two warnings. Okay. And so now we see uh, checking for unstated dependencies and examples, no parsed files found. I'm not totally sure what that means. So maybe I'll come back to this other one. So this tells me that I've got undocumented code objects. And so these are um, all of my functions, right? And the only function that I want to export is this build kmer database. So this is really the only one where I want user facing documentation. And so what I can do is for that one, at least, I can find the function, which I think I put at the bottom. All right, uh, build kmer database. And I'm actually gonna move this to the very top because when you come to the kmers.r script, I want people to know that this is the main function. This is the function that kind of runs all the other functions. And so if I have my cursor inside of the function, I can come up to code and then insert roxygen skeleton here. And so this then creates a preamble so for my title, I'll say build kmer database for, for classifying 16S, rRNA, and other gene sequences to, you'll notice when I hit enter, it automatically went ahead and gave me that uh, Roxygen style comment with a pound and uh, an apostrophe. So to a genus, when a kmer size is provided. So go ahead and save that. So that's great. And now we've got our parameters and we'd like to give them some more definition so that when a user is looking at the help page for this function, they'll get uh, more information about like what, what do these things mean? And so then here I'll put a vector of reference sequences for which we have genus level, I'll put this on the next line so it doesn't scroll off the right side. Uh, and I'll tab it to make it look pretty for me. <laughs> Genus level taxonomic information in the same order as the vector as the value for genera. Okay. And so for genera, we're going to say a vector of genus level taxonomic information for reference and we'll kind of put in some tabs here reference sequences in the same order as the value for sequences um, and maybe I'll move these semicolons and at the end of this one I will also say um, ideally taxonomic information will be provided back to the domain level with each level separated by semicolons and no spaces. Okay. So we'll have to worry about that perhaps a little bit later when we go and kind of put the whole thing together. Kmer size, we'll say the length of the nucleotide word to base our classification on, and we'll say default equals eight. And so I need to make that the default because I see here I've got nothing. So I'll say equals eight. So I'll go ahead and save that. 
for the return, I'll say a uh, to be determined object containing the, the genus level uh, conditional probability of uh, seeing each kamer in a given genus as well as the genus names. And maybe I'll put a tab here to just make things line up nicely. <laughs> and then we've got the export keyword here to export this function. And there's also a spot here for examples. I'm not ready to put in an example, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove that, save, and then let's go ahead and check it again. All right, so we still have two warnings. And um, I'm seeing that it still has in here build Kamer database. And I think what I forgot to do was run document. So go ahead and run document here. And let's see, it skipped the namespace, which is odd. Um, let's go ahead and build it and check to see if it works now that I ran that. So we're down to one warning and we see that in our list of undocumented code objects, it has removed our build Kamer database function. So now we need to tell R not to worry about documentation for these other kind of utility functions that I'm using to help carry out build Kamer database. So the way to get rid of that warning is to tell R not to worry about the documentation for these helper functions. These are helper functions that aren't getting exported to a user. So you wouldn't say install Philotyper and then say, I wanna use get all Kamers. Uh, and, and so I don't need to provide you with documentation, but I need to tell the package building software that that's the case, right? So to get that to happen, we're gonna go ahead and put in a Roxygen comment, which is a pound and a tick. For some reason, my fingers keep wanting to hit pound exclamation point, which is like a shebang line on a bash script. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, sometimes my fingers are just used to doing things. So I'll go ahead and do at no RD. And this tag then, again, will tell the package building software not to, um, not to worry about documentation for this function. And I'm gonna go ahead and put two spaces between each function. It doesn't really matter, but white space is easy on the eyes and makes it easier to read your code. So who knows? These are things that are a little bit more aesthetic than functional. So again, we're gonna add this tag to each of our functions. And let's see, how many more do we have? Okay, so that's good. So now we're gonna go ahead and run document I have to get in a new workflow, a new muscle memory for my fingers, as I was saying, to go ahead and update the documentation every time through. And now I can check this. So I'm still getting a warning. And it's for these things that I just added the no RD tag to. And I think what it's trying to do is actually view these as functions that I'm exporting. And so if I come back to my namespace, I see that it's exporting everything, not just the function I want. And so I think what I need to do is go ahead and delete this namespace and start again. Um, I created this package, I think by going up to like file, new file, um, or new package or something. Um, I used the RStudio built-in tools rather than the dev tools, uh, tools for creating a package. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete the namespace file. Yes, I wanna do that. Okay, it's been deleted. And so now I'm gonna go ahead and do document again, and it should create a new namespace file for me. And so that will be down here at the bottom. And so now we see that we get this comment created by Roxygen2, don't edit by hand, and that we're exporting build Kamer database. Cool, so that's what we wanted to see. And so now I'll go ahead and close that, and I'll go ahead and check again if it builds without any warning messages, wonderful. It completed without any errors, warnings, or notes. Um, that makes me happy. <laughs> um, and so we're good. So um, we've now got basically a clean package. It, it doesn't actually work, <laughs> um, but that's okay. We'll deal with that in future episodes. One other thing that I mentioned at the beginning of this episode is that I wanna change the name of the package. So I've got it as Philotyper with an ER at the end. I wanna drop the E and make it an R. So that's stylized a little bit more like uh, like a normal R package, right? So like tidy R, deploy R, right? Um, and I like kind of odd spellings of things. So like I have a tool called Mother, which is spelled with a U instead of an E. Uh, that's not actually a R package, but that's a, 
Uh, another tool that I've made are daughter, which is D-O-T-U-R, right? So I think dropping that E will, will be pretty cool. So before I do that, the first thing I wanna do is go ahead and commit my changes because I've made um, a pretty big set of changes here. Actually, I was gonna do it here in the terminal. Maybe I'll do it up here in the tab uh, to show you how you can also use get up in um, uh, within our studio itself without having to go to the terminal. So I'll go ahead and close this um, and close out that tab. So I can then go ahead and stage these and then I can commit these changes. Add indication that helper functions don't need RD documentation. No errors on check. Maybe I'll say no errors, warnings, notes on check. So we'll go ahead and commit that. That's a long commit message, whatever. We'll go ahead and close that. So that's great. Um, we can close that too. So now we're ready to change the name of the package. So basically what we need to do is change every instance of Phylotyper with an E to Phylotyper without an E, okay? So to do that, I'm gonna start by closing our studio. For my directory, I'm gonna rename it to remove that E. Over in my terminal, I'll go ahead and navigate over to that directory. So it's on my desktop, Phylotyper, again, without the E. Uh, again, get status, everything is good. And I'll do ls. And so now we see that um, we've got Phylotyper here, right? And so I need to rename that. But again, it's under version control. So I'm gonna do git mv Phylotyper, Phylotyper, and go back and remove the E. Cool. And now I'm gonna use grep which is a great command line tool that's available in Mac and Linux. I'm sorry, I don't know what the equivalent is in Windows, but there's other ways you can do what I'm gonna do here. And that will be to do grep hyphen R, and then we'll do phylotyper on star. And so this shows us all of the files, and the file name is on the left, uh, that have a line with phylotyper, right? I'm gonna go ahead and open up my RStudio and I'll do that by double clicking on that phylotyper.rproj file. And if I come to files, so the first one was the description file. So I'll go ahead and open up description. And then where I've got the ER, I'll go ahead and remove that. And I think there were three lines, right? So there's two URLs. And so this reminds me that I also need to update my GitHub repository. So I'll go ahead and save that. And again, redo the grep and see that uh, the description goes away. And now we need to look at the two license files. So do license and remove that. And then license.md, remove that. All right, and so let's run the grep again. So I must have forgotten something in the license. Oh, hmm. okay, so I'm not sure what happened. All right, so that's why we check. So now I've got the readme rmd and the readme md as well as the test that functions. So I'm not gonna change the readme md, I'm gonna change the readme rmd and then I'm gonna rebuild the md file. So we'll go ahead to readme.rmd and then wherever we have phylotyper, um, we'll make that an E and maybe I'll replace it all the way across the file, phylotyper uh, and replace all instances and that replaced five cases, cool. And then if we again do a search, we see everything is good. And so now I'll do build readme and so this now will rebuild the readme file as a markdown file. And so um, we see that that updated the uh, markdown file there. And so again, now if I do grep on that, I've lost the readme.md files, and now I'm ready to go to tests, test that.r. So right there. And so here I've got uh, two cases. So I'll go ahead and change that. And now if we again grep, everything's gone. Cool. So um, I will go ahead and um, I'm going to test it really uh, to make sure everything works. And then I'm going to do a check. So all my tests pass. That's cool. Let's go ahead and do a check. Make sure nothing broke in doing that. So that completed without any errors, warnings, or notes. I'm going to do a git status and we see that a bunch of stuff changed. So I'm going to go ahead and do a git add description, uh, license, readme, uh, tests, test that.r. Again, you could do all this in RStudio. I find that it's sometimes easier for me to type than to kind of move my mouse around and point and click. 
And so then I'm gonna go ahead and say git commit. And then my message is going to be change package name from philo type R to philo type R. Oh, type R, right? <laughs> so again, if we do git status, everything is good. So one thing that I mentioned, right, when I was changing those URLs for links to uh, GitHub was that I needed to update the URL. And so my, if I do git remote hyphen V, this shows the remote repository that I'm working with, right? So basically what is the, what is the repository I'm working with up on GitHub? And so this is the repository for Philotyper uh, at the start of the episode. And so I can come to settings here and I'm gonna change the name by removing that E and we'll go ahead and rename it. And so now it's been changed, right? And if I look at um, the, the URL, I see that it's also lost that, that E, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and copy this. So I can do git remote set hyphen URL origin. So again, I don't know that you can do this easily in our studio and so it does kind of pay to be able to know some of Git from the command line. Again, you're probably not gonna use this function very often. Um, I, I certainly don't use it a lot. So go ahead then and paste in the, the URL. If I then do git remote hyphen V, I now see that that's been updated. I'll go ahead and do a git push to push my changes up to GitHub. That completed without a problem. Again, I could do git pull. Maybe I should have done the pull first, but everything's up to date. And if I come over here now to refresh my Philotyper page, I see that there were some changes that were made uh, just in the last half hour, which is corresponds perfectly with when I was doing this episode. All right, so everything is good to go now with our package for implementing uh, some of those discoveries we made through those benchmarking episodes to try to get our vignette to complete without causing my laptop to start smoking because it's on fire with just using so much uh, RAM. But uh, I like having this new package name without the E. I think that's kind of cool. Um, I, it take, doesn't take a lot to impress me. Um, and also, it feels really good knowing that our check function runs without any uh, errors, warnings, or notes. So that you don't miss the next episode when we start doing some more R programming to implement these new ideas, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel, and we'll see you next time for another episode of Code Club.